Well, hello and welcome. This is uh, an edible landscaping class for all of those master gardeners back in West Virginia who are uh, taking the class that uh, I sort of abandoned as I took my job here in uh, Nebraska. So I promised I would record some sessions for you. And here they are finally. So uh, this will take probably about 45 minutes to an hour uh, as we talk about edible landscaping. If you have any questions, uh, you can actually reach out to me uh, through email or social media or give me a call. Uh, and of course, if you happen upon this online and you're not one of those master gardeners in West Virginia, feel free to do so as well. So I'm going to get started here. Uh, we're going to uh, flip around here and I am going to uh, start with my PowerPoint presentation here. So it's called An Incredible Edibles in the Landscape. So I'm really going to talk about uh, using edible plants um in in the landscape so that we can grow food and have a beautiful garden at the same time as well so what is edible landscaping so it's the use of food producing plants in the constructed landscape so the way that i like to think about it is we either uh, take plants that we normally think about growing for food and we find the beauty in them and we put them in the landscape or we can also think about it the other way around. We can think about plants that we have in the landscape already, and we can find the edible qualities of those. So if we think about, if we're thinking about the edibles that we're going to add, we usually think about fruits, nuts, uh, even vegetables, herbs, edible flowers. And, you know, you can really uh, have a principle of, of what you're growing. Some people want to just grow edibles and some people like more ornamental, so you can figure out what combination works best for you. And so when we think about it, edible plants are beautiful too. Uh, so in the top left corner there, I have uh, one of my favorite landscaping plants, and that is the blueberry. So we have the wonderful blueberries that we grow uh, and people love to eat. And if you see that uh, red shrub right beside that, that is a blueberry shrub in the fall, so they're a nice uh, landscape plant, have lots of fall color, even some winter color and the nice flowers in the spring, so it's a good landscape plant. Uh, in the top right corner, rhubarb, I like to use that as a foundation plant, and I have planted it uh, several times uh, using it as such, so it's, it's a wonderful uh, edible plant to add in there. We have other things like the creeping thyme down on the bottom left, so it's an herb, uh, but it, it also makes a great ground cover. And then uh, we think about fruit trees and adding those as trees in our yard. And we can even find the edible qualities of some, some things we already have in the yard. So daylilies are one. Daylilies are almost completely edible. We'll talk about that. So some things to remember uh, when you're planting your edible landscape is that most edible plants require at least six hours of full sun. Uh, and that really depends on what you're growing. So I'll give you a little rule of thumb on the next slide whenever we figure out, but if, especially if it's a fruit bearing plant, flowering plant, plant, most likely it's going to require six hours of sunlight. Most will prefer well-drained soil, not a lot of stuff likes to have wet feet. Uh, and we also want to test soil to apply fertilizer and lime appropriately. Uh, that's especially important. We usually have uh, more acidic soils back in West Virginia uh, where we have to apply uh, lime to get that up to the, the right point. Uh, here in Nebraska, where I am, it's actually the other way around. Usually soils are uh, pretty alkaline, uh, so you don't really have to adjust it with lime, but it can be harder to grow other things. So things that like acidic soil, like blueberries, for example, that are really hard to grow here. So I'm going to have to test that uh, theory out and, and try to grow some blueberries. can begin with one-to-one -one substitution. So if you uh, are wanting to plant a tree instead of planting, uh, say, an ornamental tree, plant a fruit tree. If you're looking for some shrubs uh, to plant, uh, instead of planting ornamental shrubs, plant something edible. And one thing that we think about, uh, especially if we're planting trees and shrubs, are to choose multiple cultivars to extend the harvest. If we plant all of one type of plant, uh, then we could end up uh, having all of them come ripe at the same time. If we choose different varieties, we could end up extending the harvest over weeks or even months. So you want to think about that. So a cute little rule of thumb, this isn't 100%, but it's uh, fairly good. It'll get you close. If you grow it for the fruit or the root, 
you need full sun. If you grow up for the leaves or the stems or sprouts, partial shade is all you need. So especially if it's a fruit crop or a root crop, you're going to need the sun. But a lot of the leafy greens, uh, uh, things like that, uh, you can get by with some partial shade. Now, when I was talking about substitution, you know, talk about instead of planting a shade tree, plant a fruit tree. And you can pick all different sizes from dwarf to semi-dwarf to even standard size large trees. So you can think about doing that. Or how about instead of an ornamental shrub, maybe plant a fruiting shrub. So we uh, substitute out here instead of the butterfly bush, uh, which is still an okay plant. It feeds pollinators, though uh, in some areas it is becoming invasive. So you've got to watch out for that. Uh, the plant on the right there is a shrub with beautiful red berries. That's a red currant. So you can uh, substitute that out as well. So I'm going to start off talking about plants that uh, are what we would consider edible plants. You might find them more likely in a vegetable garden or on a farm rather than in the landscape. And we're going to talk about how uh, beautiful they are and what their landscape quality is. So we're going to talk about the aesthetic properties of edible plants. And one of my favorites uh, that I love to tell people about is quinoa. Uh, this is something that uh, has been hitting the grocery shelves uh, over the last few years. It's sort of one of those miracle uh, superfoods that a lot of people like to eat. Uh, it's high in protein, gluten-free. Uh, it is actually uh, in the spinach family. It's not a grain, but people eat it as a grain. You cook the the uh, the grain uh, sort of has a almost like a rice substitute of sorts, but it uh, grows uh, sort of four and a half to, to six feet tall. Has these beautiful different color blooms on them uh, that uh, have the seed in it. You can also eat the the leaves of it. So it's it's a beautiful plant uh, that you could add uh, sort of a, a flower substitute. It could go right in the landscape as a big tall flowering plant. Uh, and that would make a great addition to the landscape. One of its relatives, amaranth, a lot of people already grow, grow these uh, as flowers, uh, but you can actually eat them. You can, also, you can eat the seeds and you can also eat the leaves of those as well. So uh, if you already have those in the garden, you can try them out. If not, I suggest adding them, trying them out. A lot of people like the leaves a little bit better than the, the seeds, and people like quinoa better than they like amaranth just uh, for flavor-wise usually. But you can give them a try out. Now moving on to some other colors, so leafy greens. Uh, this is one of my favorite. This is Swiss chard, of course, uh, and it makes a lovely plant in the landscape. Lots of uh, color. You can either find varieties that are specific one color varieties, or you can find something like this, which is usually called bright light, which are lots of different uh, colors in one mix. Uh, and they're fairly easy to grow. They'll grow almost year-round, uh, so you can add that to the landscape. In the fall or spring, you can usually find these. A lot of people just use them for ornamental, but they are totally edible. Uh, so it's flowering kale or flowering cabbage. The name is usually used uh, interchangeably. Uh, you can find them in all different colors, uh, and they uh, look great uh, in the winter landscape. Uh, they'll survive through winter, but you can also eat them. Uh, I actually saw some uh, at one of the local grocery stores here in the produce section and just had to get it and uh, serve it. So we uh, ate that for just regular kale. Some more leafy greens, this is sorrel. Sorrel is uh, perennial uh, and uh, it will grow, uh, it will spread very easily. It becomes a, a large spreading plant. Uh, it won't be invasive. You can control it fairly easily, but it will fill in the area, make a nice ground cover. Um, the interesting thing about sorrel is that it has a lemony, acidic flavor. So you can really add a lot of flavor uh, either to salads or even chop it up and add it to soup. I've seen it in uh, recipes like the, the Greek soup, the chicken and rice with lemon soup. You can add that as a green component in there to add some of that lemony flavor. This one is actually a plant that was uh, created. It uh, is not naturally occurring in nature, uh, but Luther Burbank, who uh, did a lot of plant breeding uh, a long time ago, uh, actually uh, developed this by crossing some wild plants. Uh, it's called Wonderberry. It's an interesting plant. It's actually a relative of tomatoes, and they have these tiny little uh, blackish purple berries on there. 
those have a lot of flavor on their own. They don't taste really all that that good, but you can turn them turn them into jams or jelly, something like that. The the nice thing about it, even if you don't eat them, is that uh, even though the the berries sort of look blackish, uh, once you get them crushed, it has one of the most beautiful indigo colors I've ever seen in nature. So it can actually be used as a natural dye as well. Some other tomato relatives that you might not uh, think about. We have ground cherry. Uh, these are very popular. Uh, kids love these. We sent them out to a lot of school gardens. Uh, they uh, grow in a husk, almost like a tomatillo. Uh, they're actually related to tomatillos, and those are also related uh, to tomatoes, not uh, too closely. They're not uh, in the same genus, but they are uh, related in the same family. Uh, but the neat thing about most ground cherries is they have a fruity flavor, almost like pineapple. Uh, so kids love to eat those uh, as a snack. And then another thing you may have growing in your yard that you never knew was edible is actually the Chinese lantern. It's uh, related uh, to the ground cherry there. You can see sort of the re resemblance is that paper husk on there that you remove, and then there's a berry on the inside that is edible. Now, some of the easiest edible plants to grow are probably the herbs. Uh, herbs uh, require very little care once you get them planted. Uh, they require very little water. Most of them uh, come from areas that are dry, so they actually don't like overwatering. Uh, so they can, they can hang out in a landscape without much care at all. So chives are great. They uh, would be sort of a substitute maybe for uh, ornamental grasses. You see people plant those sort of grassy-like uh, plants, uh, even some of the like the ornamental bluegrasses and those plants. Chives would be a great substitution. They have those beautiful uh, purpley blue flowers. Uh, they keep coming back year after year uh, as perennials. And the, the thing that most people don't realize about a lot of the herbs is that bluish purple flower is almost the perfect uh, color to attract bees. Bees are really attracted to that color and so uh, if you're wanting to feed pollinators that can be a wonderful addition to the garden. Another herb we look at, oregano. Oregano uh, will form uh, a good ground cover. It will spread um, and fill in an area, uh, and it can uh, be used for lots of different dishes. Most commonly, um, we have Italian dishes that use it, so if you uh, wanted to uh, make pizza sauce or spaghetti sauce or something like that, you would have that right on hand. That's also uh, part of some Mexican dishes as well, so uh, that is uh, a good addition to the garden. Then another one that I like is chamomile. Uh, chamomile is uh, not in the, the same family as the other herbs. Uh, most of them are mints, the ones that we, uh, uh, the oregano and, and things like that. This is actually in the daisy family, as you can tell. And chamomile tea is actually made out of the flower head. So you would uh, collect the flowers when they're in bloom and let them dry, and then you have chamomile tea. So that could be a, a good thing to try out, uh, either for your home garden, uh, school garden. You know, you can give the kids chamomile tea and sort of calm them down a little bit. Uh, one of my favorite plants, of course, is rhubarb. Uh, I love to use it in the landscape. I love to make rhubarb pies, rhubarb jam. Uh, so you can get different varieties. A lot of them have the red stalks. That's what most people are uh, familiar with. Some of them have green stalks. Uh, so the the end product when you cook with it isn't a, as attractive. It doesn't have that color. Uh, the one thing you do have to, to be aware of is the leaves uh, do have a toxic component to them. Uh, it's not going to really cause a death or, or anything like that. Uh, most likely it would cause um, some burning. Uh, of the lips, uh, the tongue, uh, some stomach upset, uh, possibly uh, vomiting and diarrhea, things of that nature. Um, so you do want to be aware uh, of that for pets or children, uh, but uh, usually it's not a huge effect. Another one of my favorite plants, uh, asparagus. A lot of people uh, who've never grown it don't re don't realize that it. Uh, once you stop harvesting it, it actually grows out into this big ferny mass that's a really uh, neat looking plant. Uh, so you harvest it, the stems uh, as they come up out of the ground and then you stop when they're about the size of a pencil and you let them grow up and they remain this way throughout the summer. 
they will turn brown in the fall and you leave them until the next spring and when you cut them down uh, when the, the next stalks uh, start coming up. It's a wonderful addition. Uh, you can uh, you know, use it as the background, uh, sort of a, a background plant uh, to put some flowers or something in front of, uh, incorporate it throughout the landscape. This is Jerusalem artichoke or sunchoke. It uh, is not an artichoke, uh, even though it somehow picked up that name. This is actually a native plant uh, to the eastern United States. It, it ranges from the east coast all the way to uh, the Midwest. And uh, you don't eat the upper parts, the, the flowers there, which are attractive. They're a nice sunflower, big, big tall plant. They will grow eight, nine, ten feet tall. Uh, and have small flowers on them, so uh, don't expect to have a lot of, of show from them. But you actually eat the roots, so this is the root uh, of the plant. Uh, they have tuber-like roots on there, and uh, they have sort of a nutty flavor, but it's a potato substitute. Uh, these were actually something that were that was eaten regularly by uh, the American Indians throughout the, the East. And um, it is possible that they could have been served at, say, the first Thanksgiving. So they are, uh, there, his, there is historical record of them uh, by early American cultures uh, in, the, in the diet. Uh, they're also interesting in that they contain a compound called inulin, not insulin, but inulin, uh, which actually uh, can relate, uh, reduce blood sugar uh, and a lot of. Uh, Diabetics are interested in, in that reason, but the inulin is not digestible. Uh, so not only do you get lower blood sugar, uh, but it can cause uh, some gas issues. Uh, so you don't want to eat too many of those. And there again is the, the close-up of a flower. It is attractive flower. Uh, they're just not big uh, in relation to the size of the rest of the plant. Now we have, uh, these are cranberries. Uh, cranberries are also native to the eastern United States. Uh, they grow wild in West Virginia uh, and other places, if you've ever been to Cranberry Glades. Um, you do have to have acidic soil, so if you know how to grow blueberries and can get the soil regulated down to about a pH of 4.5. Uh, you don't have to have a wet area, though. A lot of people think that they have to grow in bogs, uh, and they will naturally grow in bogs because of the low pH. Uh, and the high organic matter, but you can recreate that by using a lot of uh, peat moss, mixing it into the soil. Uh, they do like um, high moisture, so you do want to keep them well watered, but they don't have to be sitting in water all the time. Uh, the reason that they're still grown in bogs is because they're very short plants, only a few inches tall. And so um, people that started growing cranberries commercially didn't want to have to bend over and pick them, so they grew them in bogs, and so when they're flooded, uh, the cranberries float to the top of the water and they just scrape them off. Uh, so you'll have to, you will have that uh, luxury, but it does make a great ground cover. Uh, we'll fill in a lot of area. Uh, if you want to plant them around blueberries uh, as a ground cover, that would be a great idea. That would uh, be a great use of the space. This is an interesting plant. Uh, it's related to cucumbers. Uh, it's called the Mexican sour gherkin. Uh, some people call them mouse melons and kids like to call them that. Uh, they're about the size of your thumb. Uh, they get no larger than that. That is the right size. And they have a very sour lemony flavor. So kids love uh, to eat them. They're sort of like the sour candy kind of thing. Uh, they have that sort of a, a, um, a sour pop to them. And they do pop when you eat them. They're very crunchy. Uh, so they're great uh, to add. They grow just like cucumbers, uh, big, long pine. Uh, so you can find those seeds in lots of different catalogs. Now, if you're looking for vines that may be a little uh, more perennial, uh, one of my favorites, hardy kiwi. Uh, so hardy kiwi actually come from Siberia, so they are very hardy down to zone five. Uh, so we can grow them throughout much of uh, the eastern United States uh, out to the west. So they're a very interesting plant. Instead of being the, the, the kind of kiwi that you're used to in the grocery store, they're about the size of a large grape. And they are hairless. They don't have that fuzz on them. So they're almost like bite-sized kiwi. Uh, you do uh, plant multiple plants. They are, uh, they have different genders. So there's male and female plants. Uh, 
Uh, so you'll need um, at least one of each. Uh, you'll have to, to check the labels or the catalog and make sure you get one of each. Uh, though you can have up to about uh, six or seven female plants per male plant. Uh, he'll produce enough pollen for them. Uh, so you can you can sort of have a kiwi harem, uh, if you like, uh, in, the, in the garden. There are some very uh, beautiful varieties. Uh, this one is a variety called Arctic Beauty, and you can see it's uh, splotches of white and that bright pink on the leaves. Uh, very, very attractive. Another favorite plant of mine is uh, Malabar spinach. So this is a, a native of Southeast Asia. It's a tropical vine. So the, the leaves do um, sort of have a, a spinach-like flavor um, to them. Uh, they're very um, succulent. So they're much more succulent than what a spinach would be. Um, so they can be used a few ways. You can eat them raw or you can cook them. Though I would suggest uh, you either have to you have to cook them for a long time. So if, if you are uh, familiar with Indian cuisine, uh, you might uh, know of a dish called sag, S-A-A-G, uh, and that's actually what the, the Indian uh, name of this plant contains is sag. This is what it's made out of in India. And so basically, you cook the leaves uh, for a long time until they're it's almost like a sauce uh, themselves. There's not much of the, the leaf structure remaining. Uh, and the reason that these were used is that they sort of have um, a gelatinous uh, texture to them once they're cooked. Uh, and that's why you don't want to cook them for a short time, uh, sort of saute or anything like that. They don't have that, that texture is sort of odd if you just cook it for a short time. If you cook it for a long time into a stew, uh, then it actually acts as a thickening agent. So hopness or groundnut uh, is another native. It's uh, in the, the legume family, in the bean family, and uh, they're being prized for um, high nutrition. So they have uh, these edible uh, nuts on them uh, that are supposedly quite tasty and highly nutritious as well. One of my favorite trees is the pawpaw. Uh, here's the uh, pawpaw in fruit. Uh, they're a, a native plant. Uh, a lot of people, especially younger generations, don't know what they are anymore. Uh, there, there was a big uh, resurgence in their popularity over the last few years. A lot of newspaper stories and videos and things online about them. Uh, they are native to the eastern forest. Uh, they have a flavor uh, sort of like banana. Uh, a lot of people call them, say, the West Virginia banana or whatever state you're in, the Indiana banana or the Kentucky banana. Uh, but they have a much more custard-like uh, consistency. They're, uh, and these are nowhere near ripe, so most people don't eat them until they actually have black, black splotches all over them, almost like the fruit's rotten. Uh, so you can uh, eat them at, at whatever stage you want. You do need to have at least two different trees, uh, so seedlings work well for that. Uh, Though trees will form a patch, uh, and you might have heard of, of a pawpaw patch. Uh, a lot of those uh, trees, though, come up from the roots of the one single tree, um, and they actually can't uh, cross, so they can't pollinate each other if they're the same plant. So you have to have at least two genetically different plants in order to cross pollinate. So this is honeyberry. Uh, honeyberry is actually in the honeysuckle family, uh, and so it has a honeysuckle like flower, a nice fragrance. And then it uh, forms these longish, uh, blackish blue berries uh, that have a, a sweet honey-like flavor. Uh, so they can be an interesting shrub to add uh, to the landscape. Uh, quince is a relative of uh, apples and pears. Uh, it's sort of, a lot of people think it sort of looks like a combination of the two. Um, they are uh, most commonly eaten as a jam or a jelly, not really eaten raw all that much. Uh, but the reason that a lot of people plant them is because they actually have uh, very nice uh, flowers. Uh, these nice bright uh, pink flowers are, are common uh, on the quince. Now, you do have to watch out if you're wanting them to eat uh, because they do sell varieties that are sterile. So they, it's a flowering quince, 
uh, rather than a fruiting plant. So make sure that you get the, the fruiting uh, type. So one of my favorite plants, of course, the blueberry. Uh, here we have all four seasons uh, represented. The spring, we have the, the flowers, uh, wonderful white or even sometimes pink flowers. Then the blueberries in the, the summer add uh, interest. The fall red color and even some either red, uh, orange, or yellow uh, coloring on the twigs in the fall uh, and winter. And then we have uh, this interesting plant, uh, a filbert or a hazelnut. So this one is called Harry Lauder's Walking Stick or Contorted Filbert. It's actually sold a lot of times as just an ornamental plant uh, as Harry Lauder's Walking Stick, uh, which is an odd name. Uh, and most people don't realize that if they had a mate for it, that it would actually produce hazelnuts. So uh, you can get those. Some of them don't have that sort of uh, attractive quality. They're just sort of uh, basic looking shrubs, but they do have the, the benefit of producing hazelnuts, which are absolutely delicious. But now I'm going to go through my list of uh, landscape plants that have edible qualities. Uh, so these are things that you might already have in the garden that you never knew uh, you could eat. The first one is a crocus, but it's not just any crocus. It's a saffron crocus. Uh, so this is where the spice of saffron comes from. It's from the filaments. You see the, the sort of orangish, uh, reddish color filaments in the middle of the flower. Uh, that is the saffron. There are only three filaments per flower and they have to be harvested by hand. That's why saffron is the most expensive spice in the world. Uh, but it's very interesting. These don't bloom in the spring like uh, most other crocuses that we're used to. They actually bloom in the fall, September, October, about that time frame. Uh, and they're very large flowered. Uh, they're much bigger uh, than other crocuses. So you can spread these throughout the landscape and uh, harvest yourself a little bit of saffron to try out. It doesn't take a whole lot uh, to use in a dish. So um, you can usually find these uh, online. You plant them, uh, of course, the bulbs. And you can uh, usually find them in bags of 25 to 35 to 50 bulbs. Uh, and that would give you a, a small supply of saffron. Passion flower uh, is another thing that we think of as tropical, but it actually can grow uh, in uh, the area. It uh, doesn't overwinter well. You'll probably need to start it from seed, but you can uh, actually grow this. And uh, from passion flower, if you get the right variety, it will produce passion fruit. Not all varieties produce uh, in our area will produce a, a viable fruit that will be edible, but you can find some varieties uh, that do that. The bumblebees absolutely love these. This one is actually from uh, my backyard, and it was a, a lovely plant. Um, unfortunately, I ended up with a variety I don't think that really produced fruit, or we didn't really care for it. So this is a rose. Uh, roses produce a fruit called a hip, uh, and it's, they're actually uh, closely related to apples. They might look like a, an apple if you got up close to look at them. Rose hips uh, have more vitamin C uh, per ounce than citrus fruit. Uh, and a lot of people will either make um, jams or jellies out of them or dry them and make tea out of them. So it can be an interesting uh, use. You'll want to find a rose. Not all roses produce uh, hips. Some of the newer hybrids, uh, the ones that are made to, uh, say, be reflowering, uh, they don't really produce hips. Uh, but some of the old-fashioned varieties do produce. Nasturtium, a lot of people know about nasturtiums, uh, so you can eat the, the flowers mainly. Sometimes you can eat the young leaves or even the seeds. Some people will uh, use those as well. They're very spicy. Uh, you can add them to salad, uh, and they have a very peppery bite, almost uh, like a very strong watercress-type uh, bite. Now this, even though you might say this doesn't look like a dogwood, it is. Uh, so this is a Cornelian cherry dogwood. Uh, now, I will tell you that almost all dogwoods uh, produce edible berries. Most people don't realize that, but whenever you see the berries on a dogwood, uh, they're edible. And so this one is probably the one most prized for flavor. Uh, even though people don't really eat them raw, they turn them into jam or jelly, 
uh, because really, you know, jam, making homemade jam or jelly is really just a, a way to eat sugar. If you've ever seen the recipe, you know, for jam or jelly, it's, you know, three cups of fruit and six cups of sugar. Uh, so uh, that sugar goes a long way in adding flavor. So these flowers give way uh, to these uh, cherry-like fruits uh, that people turn into jam or jelly. Now, if you uh, don't want to pick all these small little berries, uh, if you get the Korean or the Kusa dogwood, which a lot of people are turning to because they have disease resistance against anthracnose, uh, which is a common uh, dogwood disease, these are resistant. Uh, they actually produce these very large, uh, spiky-looking fruits that are edible. You can turn them into jam or jelly. So what would you eat out of a pine tree? Well, you can turn the pine needles into tea. Uh, I've heard people doing that. But the most common thing that we eat out of a pine tree are pine nuts. Uh, so the seeds that come out of a pine cone are pine nuts. So most pine trees will produce seeds that are edible. Uh, these four varieties, though, typically have larger, uh, more flavorful uh, seeds that are used for pine nuts, the white bark, Korean, Siberian, or dwarf. Uh, these are the ones that are most commonly used to produce pine nuts. And you can imagine, you know, pine nuts are fairly expensive if you go to the grocery store to buy them. And that's because they have to be harvested out of these pine cones. Of course, day lilies are edible. So the flower is edible. You can eat them raw, put them in um, a salad. Um, you can also uh, batter dip them and deep fry them. And what isn't good if you batter dip it and deep fry it? Uh, you can also eat the young shoots, the young green shoots as they come up out of the soil. Uh, or you can also eat the roots. They have tuber-like roots and they can be uh, cooked uh, and uh, eaten. Hostas, also edible. Uh, you can actually uh, use the young leaves in a salad or steam or cook the leaves uh, and eat those as well. So uh, you can you can see a connection between the day lilies and hosta. If a deer will eat it, then you probably can too. Uh, that's sort of the basis of the deer buffet. Canna, so these are um, flowers that are used commonly in landscapes. Uh, the roots are actually edible. They're actually a, a staple crop in some areas of Africa. Uh, and so you can add those to the landscape uh, as well, all different colors and sizes. Um, and you know, not that you have to eat them, but it might be worth trying them out. Edible loom pines, so I will, um, I'll start off by saying that not all lupines are edible. It's a, and, and, well, some of them are toxic, so you want to make sure uh, that you, if you want to try them out, uh, you get the varieties that are edible that don't have the toxins in them. Uh, you can find them in catalogs. Uh, most commonly, things like uh, the Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Catalog, they sell them. So they produce like a, a bean-like pod, and you eat their seeds like beans, almost like a cooked bean, a cooked dry bean. So you can uh, check those out. So don't go around eating just the regular lupines. They do have toxins in them. You will live to, to regret it if you live. Uh, so you want to avoid that. Pansies and violas, of course, very um, easy. You can add them to salads, uh, or you can do the the trick where you uh, use an egg wash, uh, an egg white uh, wash, and dip them in sugar and sugar them and put them on desserts. Uh, I've seen uh, that done quite a bit. Use them as garnish. Um, I've seen them used uh, a lot on dessert, so they're they're easy to add um, if you have them around. Chicory. So you might have seen this growing along the roads. Uh, a lot of people may not be growing this in their gardens, but this is uh, actually a coffee substitute. Uh, so during the Civil War, there was an embargo uh, on the South and the South. I uh, couldn't get coffee, so they turned to chicory. They roasted the roots. They they thought it sort of tasted like coffee, even though it didn't have any caffeine in it. Uh, but today, you can still buy coffee in the South, especially, uh, that has uh, chicory root in it for flavor. Uh, so you can still find that, or you can grow your own and uh, give it a try. And here is uh, cranberry viburnum. So this is a viburnum shrub. A very attractive love the red false foliage on it uh, and we have the the white flowers that are also attractive 
but they produce these uh, red berries on them uh, that uh, are edible and have a cranberry-like flavor. Uh, some people may even call this a high bush cranberry, um, but it is a viburnum rather than a, a true cranberry. Uh, but uh, they, I, I do think it's a beautiful plant, uh, would look beautiful in uh, any landscape. So we take some of these plants and let's look at some examples. So these are things that I just found uh, on different uh, sites throughout the internet, things that I think uh, show what is possible by incorporating edibles into the landscape. So first we see this one. So this is a lovely uh, raised uh, garden. Uh, and you can see, I don't know if, how many edibles you can see in there, but there's chamomile, uh, the, the white flowers there, that's chamomile. And then uh, thyme uh, is the herb that's growing in the center there. And then behind it, we actually have a few different uh, colors of Swiss chard. Uh, so those are some beautiful examples. Uh, so that is almost completely edible, everything in that picture. Uh, and it's a beautiful garden. Now this is a trend that I've seen lately and I actually quite like it. It's just taking the, the regular red or purple cabbage plants and incorporating them right into the landscape along with flowers. So we see that here. Uh, they've just incorporated those in there. And when you're ready to harvest, you just uh, cut it out, uh, probably take the plant out with it because once they uh, have been there a while and the, you've harvested them, they, they don't look uh, as good. But uh, you can incorporate those right into the landscape. Now, believe it or not, uh, there is a house in this picture on the way back in the center. You can see the front door there, uh, and there's a lot going on. So back close to the house, we see a, a tall uh, plant to the right that is actually corn. So they've used that as a substitute uh, for a uh, ornamental grass. So I've, I've heard of people doing that. Uh, where you actually, um, you know, instead of planting an ornamental grass, uh, go out in your yard and plant corn in a circle, and it will sort of uh, take on the same effect. Uh, on the left side, we have a big tall, I think that's some sort of a large bean plant, uh, maybe like the big long hyacinth bean or, or something like that. We have several herbs mixed in, including a rosemary in a pot that sort of looks like an evergreen tree. Uh, there's some squash in a pot. Uh, on the other side from that, and then lots of other edibles uh, sticking through there. Here uh, we uh, see some lettuce that's been used to create patterns in a garden. So lots of different colors of lettuce are used to make those striping patterns uh, that uh, I think is very attractive. Uh, the one on the left side, you can see it's right beside the patio. So what's fresher than just reaching down and grabbing your salad for dinner there? Um, or it can be a little more formal. So um, this is a boxwood garden. All the edging is boxwood, but the stripes of different colors are all different lettuces. And then the two beds uh, in the center on the, well, all the center beds, the top, bottom, and the middle, uh, all have herbs in them. And so it's a, a more of a formal uh, looking garden, but it is an edible landscape. So here we have, um, sort of an attractive garden, even though it's more of the raised bed vegetable garden look, it's been uh, de designed with an aesthetic in mind. Uh, so we have all the different types of lettuce uh, and then several herbs uh, going on in there as well. And then flowers, I believe all of them are edible flowers, looks like a lot of pansies and things like that. So it's actually a very attractive uh, edible garden. So here we have uh, a pond, so that's sort of a, a fake uh, ornamental bee thing, because bees don't really live on those. Uh, but we have some rhubarb going on. Uh, we actually have uh, some different amaranth. You can see that, edible. And then uh, a few different herbs around, it looks like. So they've incorporated those edibles into that uh, pond garden. Here we have sort of a more wild cottage garden look. We have herbs going along the path, some beans on the left, some other edibles uh, going along the path. Uh, so you can see uh, incorporating them into all different kinds of garden styles. Here's a simple little uh, raised bed at a porch. You can see those are 
actually look like different types of Asian greens, pak choy, bok choy, and then some lettuces down below. Now, I don't think that uh, this is just stuck with the in-ground gardening. We can do it in container gardens as well. So here we have uh, some different additions. So the, the, the pot on the far right looks like some purple cabbage and some bronze fennel. And then the one on the left looks like a, a red lettuce with some parsley and some more of the purple cabbage. So we have those wonderful uh, color combinations in there that I think look both aesthetically pleasing uh, and uh, also provides lots of flavor, lots of great edibles. We have some more large containers, just uh, you know, looking at the cabbage and some edible flowers. Uh, and then the next one's here. I love these. Uh, we have more of the purple cabbage, uh, the flowering kale, uh, purple pansies, so uh, a purple theme. Now, I would take this a bit uh, further, and I would love to do this at my own house. I love this next concept. So this is flower uh, window boxes, and we can see uh, that they are full of all of these different uh, purple and dark colored kales uh, and uh, cabbages. There are a few ornamental plants in there, the ones that are hanging down, uh, but this is mainly uh, just different forms of kale, uh, and that is just a beautiful garden, and I love uh, both the, the form of it and the colors of it. And then we look here, so this is the side of a building, so we can incorporate some different growing techniques. So if you look at this at a glance, you might think that this is um, the, uh, say, uh, downspout or something like that uh, that you would put uh, along a house, but it's not. These are actually uh, used in hydroponics. It's a, a nutrient film, so you it's sort of it's sort of like a gutter that you would put on a house, but they're made specifically for gardening, um, where the water flows along and the roots are are uh, in sort of a, a matrix uh, that the water flows by, and it starts at the top and it just the water will work its way down, and then at the very bottom it flows into sort of like a little water garden, where then the water is. Uh, Sort of recirculated and pumped back up to the top. I think it's a neat concept. I think it would be a great wall garden indoors or out. Um, and uh, they've picked some some different uh, lettuces there that make it look attractive. Some different colors. Uh, so there are uh, some things that you can use to sort of get some more um, information. Some some more tools that you can use, lots of different books uh, on the subject. So just a few uh, that I found, uh, Edible Landscaping by Rosalind Creasy. That's probably one of the earlier ones uh, that came out, still a, a great uh, book. And The Edible Front Yard uh, by Yvette Solar is also um, a very popular one. Edible Estates, um, looking at uh, the attack on the front lawn. Uh, and then Landscaping with Fruit, uh, by uh, Lee Wright is a very uh, popular book talking about different fruits that you can incorporate into the landscape. There are some online resources you can check out if you're looking for gardening information in general, uh, but also sometimes some edible landscaping. So all of the Master Gardener, this is a good um, place to find um, scientifically based uh, information and also to find great ideas. So you can find them on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Pinterest. Also, if you're looking for more science-based information, if you want to make sure you're getting good information, uh, the Garden Professors, um, so it's a, a science-based gardening group. You can find them on Facebook uh, or at thegardenprofessors.com. And then if you want to keep in touch with me, if you have questions, uh, if you just want to follow along, uh, keep up. So it's at Urban Garden Guru uh, on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and I have a website there, uh, and it's missing the U in the front for some reason there. Can't believe that. Uh, so it's urbangarden.guru. You can also email me, john.porter at unl.edu, or you can give me a call. My direct line is 402 444 So I'm glad you joined along uh, with uh, this talk. And uh, I hope all is well back in West Virginia. 
and I hope to uh, hear great things from your Master Gardener group.